Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 times Newman went full Newman. So I'm hanging it up. You quit the post office? Kind of. I'm still collecting checks, I'm just not delivering mail. For this list, we're looking at the times this portly little mailman shined as Jerry's rival, Kramer's sidekick, or by showcasing his offbeat and entertaining perspective of the world around him. Since we'll be mentioning a few significant somethings from this show about nothing, a spoiler alert is in effect. Is there a Newman moment that makes you go postal? Tell us in the comments. Number 10, The Bicycle Judge. A hasty barter involving a bicycle, Elaine's stiff neck, and Kramer's questionable shiatsu training leaves the friends in a dispute over the ownership of said bike. Can I have a nice ride? Oh, great ride. Oh, that's good, because it was your laugh. What are you talking about? We had a deal. You gotta give me back that bike. Look at this! Look! Jerry suggests that both sides seek a black-hearted moderator who cannot be biased by human emotion. Enter Newman. Newman taps into his infallible sense of justice, monologuing on how the law is all that separates the civilized from the barbarians. As a federal employee, I believe the law is all we have. It's all that separates us from the savages who don't deserve even the privilege of the Daily Mail, stuffing parcels into mailboxes where they don't belong. Damn it! Though it may seem trivial to us, Newman considers the conundrum with decisive gravitas. Ultimately, what seems like a half-witted decree, splitting the bike literally in half, proves that Kramer values the bike more than Elaine, as he pleads that it not be destroyed. Yeah, not so fast, Elaine. Only the bike's true owner would rather give it away than see it come to harm. Kramer, the bike is yours. What? Sweet justice. Newman, you are wise. Maybe there is a method to Newman's madness after all. I bought it from Kramer. He was hard up for cash. Uh, 50 bucks, can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I had to make some minor modifications, you know, solid tires, reinforced seat post, uh, heavy duty shocks. Number nine, solving Elaine Bennis' barking dog problem. A neighbor's barking dog is robbing Elaine of much needed sleep, and once again, it's Newman to the, um, rescue? Kramer suggests Newman as a means to have the dog captured and moved, and Elaine, despite hesitance, agrees. You're gonna rub out the dog? <laughs> no, no, not me. I just happen to know someone who specializes in exactly these kinds of sticky situations. Uh-huh. What, you're considering this? What's so quintessentially Newman is how he relishes the wicked task, puffing his cigarette like a Bond villain and reflexively ranting about how dogs are vile and useless. I see many dogs on my mail route. I'll bet there's not one type of mutt or mongrel I haven't run across. If you ask me, they have no business living amongst us. Vile, useless... Newman! Vile, my Newman! What's more, when the dog finds its way home and leads the police to the kidnappers, Newman cryptically expects the arrest. He even assures Kramer and Elaine that a swarm of mailmen will have them back on the streets shortly. What took you so long? <laughs> Nah, don't worry about a thing. In 20 minutes, that place will be swarming with mailmen. We'll be back on the street by lunch. We're more than a little curious about Newman's enigmatic connections to the mail carrier underworld. Look, Buford, <laughs> it's the mailman. <laughs> you remember the mailman, don't you? <laughs> Number eight, busting Jerry Seinfeld for making out during Schindler's List. All right. All right, you go ahead. You go ahead, you keep it secret. But you remember this. When you control the mail, you control information. Remember getting in trouble for making out at the movies? Imagine that shame following you into adulthood. Such is Jerry's fate when he and his girlfriend are starving for alone time from his visiting parents. It's only two more days. Right. Thursday, 3 o'clock. <laughs> During a screening of Schindler's List, they succumb to a session of passionate necking, which is unfortunately witnessed by none other than Newman. With all the glee of a grade school snitch, Newman's first stop is to see Jerry's parents to tell them about what he witnessed. But we have to spell it out for you? He was moving on her like the stormtroopers into Poland. <laughs> Jerry was necking during Schindler's List? Yes. 
and a more offensive spectacle I cannot recall. He begins with a coy hint, upgrades to the blunt tattle, and ends with a rascally delivered. Oh, by the way, you didn't hear this from me. Ta-ta. Newman clearly will seize any opportunity available to ruin Jerry's day, no matter how juvenile. Number seven, when he crushed hardcore on a lane. You have a girlfriend? I had a girlfriend, <laughs> and she was pretty wild. <laughs> I don't remember you with a girl. Nevertheless. He might be a mystery wrapped in a Twinkie, but one secret Newman lets us in on is the crush he harbors for Elaine. In the season eight episode, The Soulmate, Newman reveals he is a talented poet at heart when he offers lyrical lines to Kramer to help him woo Jerry's girlfriend, Cyrano de Bergerac style. Her bouquet cleaved his hardened shell and fondled his muscled heart. He imbibed her glistening spell just before the other shoe fell. When Jerry asks him to stop, Newman agrees in exchange for advice on courting Elaine. I can't believe I'm losing Pam. I know how you feel, for I too have a woman for whom I pine. I thought we were talking about me. <laughs> right. Though the infatuation's origins are unclear, Newman exhibits on multiple occasions that he will go to extremes for love even ready to go as far as to get a vasectomy. Elaine, what, what does she have to... Oh, no. <laughs> you dated her. Give me some inside information, anything I can use. Well, I know she doesn't want to have kids. When this postman's passions are high, whether ruthless or romantic, he assuredly pulls no half measures. Number six, when he was the white whale. A modern-day Ahab in Seinfeld's Manhattan takes the form of a meter cop with an eye patch. His white whale? A scofflaw with a brown sedan that's been accumulating parking violations and evading capture for years. For 16 years, I pursued him, only to see him give me the slip time and time again. I've never got a clean look at his face, but he's become my white whale. Leave it to Kramer to unearth the perpetrator's identity as our favorite stocky postal worker. When confronted, Newman breaks down from living a life looking over his shoulder. I couldn't, I couldn't tell anyone. So you've been living this secret the whole time by yourself? <laughs> I wanted to tell somebody. Help me, Kramer! He goes on to weep even harder when the judge decrees the car be kept in a garage at his own expense, else it be impounded. What's best for the city and possibly for yourself is for you to keep your car in a garage <laughs> to your home. I can't afford that. It seems Newman's mischief makes him a gnawing thorn not only in Jerry's paw. And when in trouble, his response will always be flight or flare for the dramatic. Number five, driving bottles to Michigan for an extra five cents. How far would you go for an extra nickel? When Newman learns that New York bottles can be returned for five additional cents in Michigan, he obsessively crunches numbers in hopes of financial gain. Though Kramer insists it's an impossible task, Newman gets a Mother's Day mail route that'll take him through the Great Lakes State. The mother of all mail days. <laughs> Guess who signed up for the truck? A free truck? <laughs> With calculations in their favor and a Christmas sleigh's worth of recyclables, they hit the road together in pursuit of that glorious marginal profit. 9,998 bottles and cans. We fill up with gas. We count up our cash. 9,997 <laughs> It's comical to note that Kramer had previously thought of this scheme, but long given up. What is this uh, MI 10 cents? That's Michigan. Michigan, you get 10 cents. 10 cents? Yeah. Wait a minute, you mean you get 5 cents here and 10 cents there? You could round up bottles here and, and run them out to Michigan no, that for doesn't the work. Yet it was the light bulb over Newman's head that ignited the adventure, wonderfully showcasing how Newman so perfectly plays Sancho Panza to Kramer's Don Quixote. How much gas we got? Three quarters of a tank. That's better than we estimated. That is $7.22 better. Number four, going to trial over a speeding ticket. 
Once again, Newman injects the mundane with a hyperbolic level of drama. You have to take the stand. Well, I can't. Well, let me remind you of something. You wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for me and my helmet. I saved your life. You would be dead. Dead. You would cease <laughs> to exist. You'd be gone for the rest of eternity. Can you even begin to comprehend what that means? Shut up. When he incurs a $75 speeding ticket, he stubbornly takes his case to trial in order to subvert the fine. Claiming he was in a hurry to stop a friend from taking his own life, Newman enlists Kramer to play the part of set friend. Yes, I admit I was speeding, but it was to save a man's life. A close friend, an innocent person who wanted nothing more out of life than to love, to be loved, and to be a banker. The scheme goes awry when Kramer forgets the alibi mid-questioning due to temporary amnesia resulting from a recent head injury. Phone call. <laughs> Yes, a phone call. From who? From me. From you? Yes, from me. From me, I called you, remember? Called me? Yes, I called you, you idiot. The most entertaining part is Newman's invention of an elaborate backstory involving Kramer's father and a lifelong aspiration to be a banker. You, 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 you can't live without being a banker. Yeah, yeah, if I can't be a banker, I don't want to live. It seems someone has taken one too many acting classes. Number three. The Keith Hernandez Magic Loogie Theory. Picture it, June 14th, 1987, when the lives of Kramer and Newman would be changed forever. For on that fateful day, they were spit on by Mets first baseman Keith Hernandez. Who was it? He spit on us. <laughs> and I screamed out, I'm it! <laughs> then I turned and the spit ricocheted off him and it hit me. Well, allegedly. Jerry points out with in-depth analysis that details of the boy's story don't add up. If the spit had occurred as they claimed, it would have required magical abilities. The spit then splashed off the wrist, pauses in midair, mind you, <laughs> makes a left turn and lands on Newman's left thigh. That is one magic loogie. Viewers might catch that this scene is a parody of Oliver Stone's JFK, which also features Newman actor Wayne Knight, a Seinfeldian version of the famous assassination conspiracy. The bullet then turns right and re-enters Conley's body at his right wrist. The whole ordeal is silliness taken seriously in classic Newman fashion. But was there really a second spitter? We may never know. It was McDowell. But why? Why McDowell? <laughs> well, maybe because we were sitting in the right field stands cursing at him in the bullpen all game. Number two, interrogating Jerry for mail fraud. I'm John Corelli, Mr. Pramell, assistant district attorney. I have to inform you this session's being taped. Jerry tries to cheat the system with an insurance claim on a broken stereo. Newman, however, won't let Jerry get away with it, flagging the claim for suspected mail fraud. Grandma, <laughs> you uh, might as well run along. Jerry may be a while. Suspicion of mail fraud. Newman then proceeds to go full detective, subjecting Jerry to interrogation tactic cliches. Unfortunately, he forgets that the spotlight belongs on the interviewee, not the interviewer. And this becomes especially clear when Jerry takes a sip from a cold soda that makes him quite comfortable. Great. Hot. Actually, I'm quite comfortable. Newman does eventually bust Jerry with the help of photographic evidence, though the punishment is no more than a small fine. We guess he'll take whatever wins he can get. Not so fast, pretty boy. <laughs> There's more to this sordid little affair. Did you notice Newman using a clicker for the photographic evidence, even though it wasn't a slideshow? The subtlety of his buffoonery knows no bounds. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few other full Newman moments that deserve some honorable mention. Newman the Cleaner. Too many muffin bottoms? Who are you going to call? All right, I'm going to need a clean eight ounce glass. What is going on here? If I'm Kurt, then I apologize. <laughs> but as I understand it, we have a situation here. Tempted by cannibalism. One butter shave too many, and you might end up on Newman's dinner table. Hey, buddy. Newman hates broccoli. Two words, vile weed. You'd like to have a piece? Gladly. <laughs> vile weed! Being the 
harbinger of fleas. What else would he bring but candy wrappers and parasites? Crawling on your skin, up your legs, up your spine, up your back. An epic game of risk. From apartments to the subways of New York, you never disturb world conquest. I'm not beaten yet. I still have armies in the Ukraine. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, when he forewarns of Jerry's downfall. We were choking on our snacks, too, when we saw Newman's hysterical reaction to the finale's unforgettable verdict. We find the defendants guilty. But the moment that epitomized our love-hate relationship with the character was this one. After learning that NBC had granted Jerry and the gang a private jet, they elect to fly to Paris. And Newman desperately pleads to go along. But alas, I can't afford it, for I am, as you know, but a simple postal worker. That's a shit. Take me! Take me! Jerry, of course, refuses, and that's when Newman unleashes all the fury that encompasses their arch rivalry. With Shakespearean fervor, he bellows a warning of Jerry's doom, using epic imagery like a blowing evil wind. When an evil wind will blow through your little play world and wipe that smug smile off your face, <laughs> and I'll be there in all my glory! Newman stands tall with evil jubilation and shows us one final time why he's the perfect Lex Luthor to Jerry Superman. They are going to be held accountable. This time... They are the ones who will pay. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.